My name is Holly, uh, for Eric said, uh, alongside my husband, we lead here at the Springs Church. How awesome was it to see Sebastian up here? It's so awesome because because we're family here and we want to make sure that people know each other. It's not like showing up at Thanksgiving and you're like, there's Great Aunt Myrtle. And you're like, I didn't even know I had a Great Aunt Myrtle. We're not doing that here. We are having a family and come to get to know one another. And so I'm super excited. You guys are gonna meet, um, and, and like many of you do know Heather and Teresa, but some of you guys don't and you guys get to hear from them. Um, just more in the family. So like Eric said, we are finishing up through the book of Habakkuk. It's been a wild, fun ride. Um, and just two themes that I want to I wanna just kind of go over and just as like, you know, just kind of like, remember when we talked about this? Um, so two themes that I felt like came out of the book of Habakkuk. And the first one is that we wait expectantly for the Lord. Like, it's not, he's not going to work on our time. And maybe not what we want, but he's going to answer. And like when we stand like Habakkuk did on the watchtower, then we will know that he is going to answer. He is faithful to do that. The second theme that I, that I, I actually posed it more of a question of where is your hope? Where is your hope? Because, because we live in a society that is chasing hope here and there and everywhere. But if your hope is not in Christ, then you are going to be severely disappointed. And so the third theme that I feel like that comes out of Habakkuk is suffering with hope. Like, is that even possible? And so when we look at the book of Habakkuk, we know that it's possible. When we read at the, at the end of Habakkuk in his song in, in chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, he says this, So the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines. The produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength, and he makes my feet like deer's, and he makes me tread on my high places. That is a hopeful statement. Look, Habakkuk was not going to be around for the destruction of Judah, but he wrote those words down for the people who would need them so that they would, in the midst of their suffering, would have hope, hope that the Babylonians would have to, be, would have to answer for all, their, all the things that they did. That's what the book of Habakkuk in chapter 2 was about, of everything that Babylon was going to answer for but also the hope of a redeemer that had been promised long ago. And so there is this hope in suffering. And so as I was thinking about it, I was like, well, let's talk about the reasons why we suffer from the Bible. We'll look at the Bible on this. And, and I came across three. And so the first one is suffering from sin. Suffering from sin. We do not need to look far to see the consequences of sin. We do not need to look far. Listen, our Hearts and our souls long to be made whole in a world that is full of death and decay. And so when we look at the Bible, we see the consequences of our actions, right? David is a really great example. David, we love David. We talk about David, but we all know that David done messed up. <laughs> he done messed up. He was like, "Woo, check out that pretty girl. Bring her here. Uh, she's married. That's okay. Nobody needs to know. She gets pregnant, and he's like, oh, no. Oh, no. We need, to, we need to fix this. Yo, Uriah, you should come home and come hang out with your wife. And Uriah's like, listen, I'm a servant. I cannot go and have fun with my wife while my brothers in arms are fighting in the war. And David's like, oh, no. We have a problem. Oh, no. So he tells his commander, he says, listen, listen, um, I'm going to need you to put Uriah on the front yard line. He's going to like that uh, because he's a servant and he loves me. So uh, put him on the front line. And then in the heat of battle, everybody stepped back. He set that murder up real good. And when you look at the story in 2 Samuel, 11, 2 Samuel 11 and 12, you'll see this, you'll, cut, you'll find this story. And at the end of chapter 11, it says that the thing that David did was evil in the sight of God's eyes. So chapter 12 opens up, and God sends the prophet Nathan to talk with David. Now, time has passed, nine months of pregnancy, okay? Nine months of pregnancy, David thinks he's good, he's hidden it, it's fine. 
So Nathan comes along, and he's like, hey, what's up, king? And David's like, hey, Nathan, come on in. Nathan is not, I mean, David is not suspecting anything because Nathan comes often enough of like, I've got a word from the Lord. So Nathan's like, story time. Let me tell you about this rich king, this rich man, and he had all these sheep. There was a poor man, and he had one lamb that he loved, and he fed by hand, and he loved him. And the king, this, this great rich man, had a, had a guest come. And what, what do you think he did? Let me tell you, King David, he uh, went and took the lamb of the poor man. David's like, are you serious? What? That's so messed up. That guy should die. I'm so, I'm so angry. And Nathan's like, that's you, dude. And David, you can read his response in Psalm 51. It is this beautiful psalm of repentance. He says, it is you, Lord, only you that I have sinned against. And Nathan tells him, Nathan tells him, okay, the Lord sees your repentance and he, give, and he forgives you. But this is what's going to happen. The son of your iniquity is going to die. And so when we read in 2 Samuel 12, we see that David actually spends time praying and fasting. When his son gets sick, he spends seven days praying and fasting. His servants were like, please, king, eat. Please, please, king. And just David is there crying out to the Lord, not eating, not moving. And then his son dies. And the servants are nervous to talk to him. And they're like, oh, man. David's like, did my child die? They were super nervous. They're like, if he reacted that way, how is he going to react that his son is dead? Yes, king, your son is dead. And David picks himself up off the floor, and he goes and he washes himself and sits down to have a meal. And the servants are confused. They're like, wait, king, oh, king, let, you, you didn't move for seven days, and now, now you should be grieving. And David responds to them. He says, while the child was still alive, I fasted and I wept. For I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. You see, David understood the consequences of his sin. He said, all right, I paid that. I paid that. He understood that he made a mockery of God's name. Because you see, people think, oh, but that's terrible. See, God did love David, and God did forgive David. But that doesn't excuse the sin. The sin needed to be answered for. But yet David still had hope. He had hope that one day he was going to be with his son again. Sometimes we suffer because of sin. The second reason I see when I look in the Bible is we suffer from another's another's actions or sins. Sometimes there's people who are just mean and cruel. The Babylonians were those kind of people. And so they would suffer under, the, uh, the people of Judah, any nation under Babylon would suffer. from suffer. And so when somebody puts their, their wants over another person's needs, there's always going to be some sort of suffering. And when someone chooses a sinful lifestyle, then that affects everyone. People think sin is just a personal thing, like, God only judges me. I don't know why people make that statement because that should seriously scare the hell out of you. Like only God can judge me, the creator of all. Anyway, people are that arrogant and we're going to talk about pride and arrogance in that. But when somebody chooses a sinful lifestyle, then everybody is affected. There is no personal sin. Sin is this ugly thing that reaches far and wide and people get hurt. And so when I was thinking about this, I thought of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the people that Habakkuk were writing his letter for because they were carried off into Babylon. But the Lord gave them favor along with Daniel. When you find the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel 3, you read the story of these three young men who decide that the king, this king Nebuchadnezzar is, there's no, he's no one. So King Neb, okay, funny story, because I, I will share this. Um, I was rehearsing, because I woke up super early this morning, and so then I was rehearsing it in my mind, and I'm just listening. And then, um, if you know how my brain works, pop culture references, movie references, <laughs> I was like, King Neb 
ends up being like, because I told you guys a couple weeks ago, King Nebuchadnezzar ends up like losing his mind and eating grass, right? Like, like a cattle. And then I was thinking about the emperor's new groove and how Cusco is this arrogant, arrogant emperor and he ends up getting turned into a llama and he gets humbled and he ends up eating grass like a llama. So anyway, I don't know. There's my little, little preview ah, into Holly's mind. But anyway, anyway, so King Nebuchadnezzar, so this is before he loses his mind, but King Nebuchadnezzar in his pride is like, look at all this stuff. You know what would be great is if people worshiped me. So I'm going to make an amazing, huge golden statue that looks like me. So they do that, and he says, okay, now I'm going to make a law that whenever the music plays, everybody has to worship me. So that happens, and so he's just there. I imagine he's enjoying it. Ah, look at all these people bowing and worshiping to me. Some of his advisors are like, King Neb, <clears throat> sir, uh, remember those three guys from Judah that you brought into your court? Yeah, they aren't bowing. King Neb's like, well, excuse me? Who do they think that bring them here? So here comes Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're standing before the, before the king, and he's, King Neb's like, okay, listen, listen here. I made a law. You see that giant statue? When the music drops, your knee drops, and you worship me. And they're like, okay. And he's like, because if you don't, I'm going to throw you into the firing furnace. And then he says this arrogant statement at the end of verse 15. He says, I'm going to throw you in that fire. And verse 15, he says, and what God is there who can deliver you out of my hand? So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what we call a clap back, right? They reply in verses 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. They're like, we don't need to answer you about this, but we are. But if, um, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand. Because listen, they recognize that God is able. He has the power. And also, they recognize that they don't belong in the hand of King Neb. Because guess what? God delivered them into King Neb's hand. So he can clearly take him out. He's like, you don't. No, king. Oh, king. No, no. Verse 18. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They said, listen, God, our God is not obligated to save us. So even if he does not save us out of the fire, we are still not bending our knee to pagan gods or to a heathen king. So the men are thrown in the fire. King Neb in his anger and pride is like, heat it up seven times hotter. And his guards are like, ah, and they fry. And so King Neb's just there, you know, stewing. And he's like, all right, they should be dead now. And he looks into the fire and he's like, hang on. Guys, come here, come here. How many guys did we put in there? They were bound up, right? I'm not seeing things, right? There was three, right? Why is there four and one of them is shining like a son of man? Listen, there was another in the fire with those men. And so King Neb calls him out and he says, come here, guys, come here. They come out. Y'all, have if you've ever been camping by a camping fire, what do you smell like? You smell like smoke, right? Some of you guys like it, some of y'all don't. It's fine. But you kind of stink. These boys did not stink. They did not smell like fire. Their clothes were not touched by fire. Amen and amen. And that's when ne King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged that that is the almighty God. And he even made a decree. He said, nobody gets to say anything offensive about their God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood that even if they suffered, they suffered with hope. The last one that I see is suffering that is meant to test and grow us. Sometimes suffering doesn't make sense, but God wastes nothing. I want you guys to see this. We do not suffer for nothing. I promise you, we do not suffer for nothing. There's a book that we tend to go to as Christians, if you read the Bible, and if you've been around enough, there's this wonderful book named Job. People are like, why do you want to read the book of Job? It's fantastic. You're like, that's such a depressing book. Okay. But it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of poetic writing that is birthed out of pain, 
out of sorrow and out of wrestling. And this book opens up of, of describing a man who is righteous and upright. And we're given like a behind-the-scenes look of, of the Lord and holding court. And uh, Satan comes along, and he's like, I've been wandering your earth, Lord. And God is like, have you seen Job? Have you seen my man Job? Job's awesome. He's blameless. He's righteous. Satan says he only worships you because you bless him with wealth and his children and everything. <laughs> Curse him, and he won't. And the Lord says, all right, you do you. And so Job, in one day, one day, loses his wealth. All of the livestock, they're taken and they're killed. He loses his children in a freak wind accident. The house collapses on itself and kills them. And as his servants are coming to give him the news, he rises up. And this is his response in Job 1, verses 20 through 22. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Lord, uh, Satan comes back. He says, Psh. he still has his health. That's why he still worships you. God says, all right, do your worst. Just don't kill him. And so Job breaks out in these awful, awful boils. Enough so that he has to take broken pot shards to scratch to relieve the itch and push out the pus from his boils. His wife, we find this part in chapter 2, and his wife says, just curse God and die. And Job responds, but Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. Francis Chan has a quote that says, can you worship a God who isn't obligated to explain his actions to you? Could it be your arrogance that makes you think God owes you an explanation? When you read through the book of Job, you see his raggedy friends, as Jackie Hill Perry calls them, his raggedy friends try to give him man's wisdom. And then Job finally has enough, and he decides to take it up with God, and he demands for God to answer him. And God does. But the thing about this book is that it doesn't answer the why. He doesn't answer why there is suffering in the world. But it is a book that offers what the limited wisdom of man can give and the raw honesty of a man who wrestles with God and a response from God that bids us to come near and to trust him. And that brings us to today. We're going to hear from Heather and Teresa Young. I'm very very honored that they said yes to come up and share their story of how they've walked with, through, through a time of suffering. I think they walked through it beautifully, of a time of suffering. Come on up, guys. Um, a time of suffering and yet still had hope. And as they come up, I want to I share this quote by C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicle of Narnia series. And he wrote, it takes courage to live through suffering, and it takes honesty to observe it. And I really, really, really believe that these two have lived through it courageously, and they've observed it honestly. So good morning. Go ahead and introduce who is who. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Um, I'm Teresa also known as Heather's mom, <laughs> Grandma T.T., and Mama T. Yep. <laughs> That's right. And my name is Heather Young. I'm, I'm her daughter, obviously. And, and Heather is our women's ministry leader. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, and um, yes. Think, yes, it's been a privilege. It's, it's a privilege to serve with Amanda uh, leading this. And underneath her, she's got an amazing team, and her mom happens to be one of the team, team leads as well. So um, go ahead and share with us your, the, like, the day that your lives were shattered. Well, April the 4th, 2018, it was, oh, April the 4th, 2018, it was a Wednesday. It started out like a normal day. 
Uh, my husband, Dave, always took me to work and picked me up. He, is com he had completely retired, so that was his thing. He loved to take me to work and pick me up. Um, the day seemed normal. That afternoon when I got off work, I was a little bit late coming out of work. And when I got there, Dave wasn't there. So immediately I started kind of going into a panic mode because this was totally not like him. If he was going to be late, he always texted, he called, he left a voicemail. He wasn't there. Fortunately for me, Heather had started at the place that I worked three days earlier and had a different shift. So I went inside and I said, Heather, your dad's not here. He's not answering his texts. He's not answering his phone. I'm really worried. I don't know what's going on. So I, I took her car. I asked her to track his phone. So I immediately headed towards home, praying the whole time that please don't let it be anything really bad. Mm -hmm. So I stopped at this park where he would normally would walk because he was an avid walker. And I saw a guy on a bike. I said, please, if you see somebody passed out in the park, please call 911. So he said, okay, I will. So at that point, I still didn't know what to do, so I just headed home. And when I got to my street, to the main street to my house, it was marked off with caution tape. So I pulled over, and there was a young man standing behind the caution tape, and I said, can you please tell me what's going on? And I explained to him in detail why I was concerned. And he said, at first he said to me, there was a car accident. And I'm like, oh. And then he elaborated, and he said it was a pedestrian and a car. And I was like, even more in panic mode at that point, because as, as I was talking to him, Heather called me, and she said, Mom, we've tracked Dad's cell phone to Harbor Island. And I said, Heather, there's an accident here at Harbor Island, and I think it's your dad. And so the young man asked me to pull over. I pulled over, and he said, I will have the detective come and speak to you in a few minutes. Well, while I was waiting for the detective, I tried to text a friend, and I must not have been making any sense whatsoever, because I was getting no response back, and I immediately thought, I've got to call my friend Heidi. I called Heidi, and I don't remember what I said to her, but we hung up, and within minutes, she was at my side. So um, she was with me when the detective and the, well, detective did come up and tell me that um, he asked me what he could help me with, and I said, I told him, and he, I, he said, can you describe your husband? And in my mind, I'm thinking, of course I can describe my husband. I've been married to him for almost 43 years. And, but I didn't. I was polite, and I and, and gave him the description, and he said to me, that kind of sounds like him. He said, but the coroner will come and talk to you when she gets here. And in my mind, I'm thinking, they don't call coroners out for people who are alive. So I, Heidi was with me by this time, and then um, when the detective and the coroner came up to talk to me, well, the coroner had a clipboard in her hand and she had Dave's driver's license on that clipboard. And I said, that's my husband. And she said, they, well, they both actually said, we're so very sorry. And at that point, I said to them both, I said, I need to know what happened. I said, I need to know what happened. I said, Dave is very careful and he is, he, he is aware of his surroundings all the time. I need to know what happened. And he said, um, the detective said, yeah, the detective, I'm sorry. The detective said, um, your husband was in the right place. He said, the driver of the car was at fault. And uh, I mean, my world was, it felt like my world was closing in around me. And um, I also asked, I said, I, I need to know if he suffered. I said, I need to know. And they, they both said to me, the detective in the corner said, you know, well, actually, it was the corner that said this to me. She said, I've been to a lot of crime scenes. 
She said, this one wasn't really bad. There was not a lot of blood, she said, which tells me that he died instantly. So as far as we know, when she hit him, it, we didn't know at the time it was a lady, but as far as we know, at the moment of impact, he, he passed away. At this point, Heather... But you, you didn't what? tell about like what exactly happened. So my dad Heather. was walking right. in the neighborhood about a mile or so away from our home. And um, the, the woman actually was driving down the street, and she actually ended up going past a bike lane and a, yeah. and a parking lane and onto the sidewalk. And dad just happened to be there. And they made contact. Yeah. So that, that's I just wanted to add that. Yeah. <clears throat> so at this point, um, yeah. <laughs> At this point, Heather still didn't know anything except that there was an accident. And you want to take over there from, yeah. with Lena? So being my third day at the job, um, I had to tell my new boss what was going on. And um, while mom had get, taken my car keys, I had actually gone to the restroom and sent a, a, just a prayer request to a group that I'm a part of just saying, dad's missing. Um, he's not answering his phone. I, I, you know, we don't know what's going on, but um, if you could please pray. And of course, immediately, some of them were just like, okay, what's going on? Where, where is your mom at? And I was able to tell them that she was on Harbor Island. And, um, and so I knew that even though I was not there, that she was being per that she was being looked after by by our community, and um, I went up to my boss and I said, "I swear I'm not dramatic. This is the, like this is not like me. I know it's my third day, but um, this is what happened." And so she instantly, my boss instantly asked, um, it, it got me in the car and drove me across town because we worked across town, and. Um, <clears throat> we, we, we got to the street that mom and Heidi were on and I just remember I saw them like we, we turned in and they were coming they, they were turning out and so I called mom and I said hey you know we're here um, can you meet us and so we actually ended up parking right by the caution tape and um, we got out of the car and my boss Lena um, got out as well and then mom and Heidi came up and they parked as well. And then Sanjay and his son Isaac ended up, they were on one side with us, they found us. And then Liz and Donna were on the other side of the accident. And um, I pulled up to, I, I got to the mom, the mom was in the passenger seat, thank you Heidi for driving. And, um, and I, I just looked at her and I said, okay, are we going to the hospital? And in my mind, I thought he was just at the hospital. I couldn't face that, you know, the, what actually happened. And mom just kind of shook her head, no. And, and I remember Sanjay was behind me, and he just held me. And I was in shock. And um, Lena, my boss, it was amazing for her to witness this because I didn't see it, but as soon as we had found out that dad was, was in heaven <laughs> with Jesus, um, their son Isaac, who was nine at, nine at the time, he, um, he got down on his knees and started praying, and Lena was a witness to that. And just to see like her share that a few days later when I was able to return back to work, it was just an amazing thing to see how God was working even in those times. And so um, we, we ended up going back to the house and I just remember it was just Sanjay and Isaac and then Donna and, and Liz were there at first. And immediately Donna started doing our dishes <laughs> and Liz started cleaning our cabinets. And so it's one of those weird things that like, I still remember it's all a blur, but you know, um, that, that ended up happening. And then everybody else, um, that was able to 
come. Did you want to talk about that? I will. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we didn't share that. This actually happened at 1.13 p.m. on that Wednesday. I got there about 4 o'clock, and then by the time the coroner had spoke to me, it was about 5 o'clock. So we did have, there was two people that had witnessed the accident. One guy actually stopped, and he checked. Dave to see if Dave was uh, alive or not and when he realized he wasn't he got a blanket out of his truck and covered Dave so we were very thankful for that mm -hmm. because we have Heather had a friend whose mother-in-law lived in the community just before the accident and she had our two children with um, her and I remember her, her telling Heather, oh, my goodness, I don't know. That, I didn't know that was your dad. She says, oh, please tell me your children didn't see that. She goes, oh, no, he was covered. So yeah. we were grateful for that. But going back to um, that night, we had 16 people at our house. Twelve of them from, were from this church. Four of them were from a life group and friendships that Heather and I had developed from another church. So we had huge huge amount of support mm -hmm. and I just want to add if you don't think you belong in community please think again because we could not have gotten through all this by ourselves yeah and um, we were very blessed to have those, these people and um, I don't think we've ever publicly thanked them but no. we are so grateful for them for being in our lives yes thank you because um Especially, well, just everybody, everybody, the texts, the phone calls, the, the just showing up and bringing meals and just everything. Um, it was a very humbling experience because I don't like to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And there was people that they didn't ask, they just did. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they were like... They showed up. They showed up. Um they showed up in the middle of the week when they'd worked long hours. And um, just, I remember, I, I, I don't have a whole lot of memory of that night. Mm -hmm. I do remember that I went out to the backyard and I was making the phone calls to certain people that I knew that I needed to call them and let them know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And then Heidi came and she had mom's phone and she's like, okay, who do I, who do I need to call? And I was like, okay. Contact Aunt Liz. She'll notify everybody. <laughs> you know? Not in a bad way. <laughs> Not in a bad way, but she just, she's just she got everybody's phone number. So just contact Aunt Liz first. And um, I just remember Heidi was sitting outside with me, and she turned to me. And even though, uh, you know, in November of the year before, she had lost her son who died. And she was like, if this is the reason why I have to walk you through this to, to, know, the, to know what you're going through, you know, I, I, I'm just here to help you. And so it was really touching because somebody who was also grieving and had gone through a painful experience to actually have to witness them helping was truly just an example of what to do yeah. when you don't know what to do. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let me ask you the next question of just walk us through your time of suffering and wrestling with God and like your journey through that and into healing and how you're here today being able to share this. Well, there were th several things I actually struggled with, but I decided that I would talk about the main thing that I struggled with. Mm -hmm. The main thing was for me is how could someone drive across a bike lane, a parking lane, up on the sidewalk, and take somebody's life. And why did it happen to Dave? Some of you knew Dave, some of you didn't, but he was one of the most kindest, loving, caring men on, that walked this earth. And he loved Heather and I dearly. And we were like the three musketeers, we did everything together. So I struggled with, how could this happen? And I struggled with that for months and months and months. I struggled so badly for answers that, and I'm almost embarrassed to share this with you. No, it's good. But I was tempted to go see a, a medium. And 
I knew it was wrong. I read it in the Bible all the time. You don't do this. And I thought, I don't really care. I want answers, and I want them now. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't just do it. I really prayed about it and prayed and prayed. I I think I prayed for several days. And then one day I was sitting on my couch, and I heard in my head, Satan tempted Jesus. And I went, oh, my goodness. I said, that's my answer. You know, why would I think that I would be any better than Jesus? Because, yes, Jesus was tempted, and he didn't give in to it. So it was my word, don't give in to this. Mm -hmm. And I did come to the realization, finally, that, you know, if God wants me to know those answers, he will give them to me eventually. And I have to wait, wait on him because he's always working in the background and he's taking care of things. Mm-hmm. So um, that was, that's my big struggle, that, or it was my big struggle. And I let Heather share because a lot of the stuff that she's going to share will, is with some of also my other struggles. Yeah. So to give a little background, um, the the woman, the driver, actually, she didn't hit and run. She actually did pull over, and the police interviewed her. Um, She was never arrested or taken to jail. Um, They questioned her and let her go, and we struggled with that because right away I'd always asked when people were asking, well, what do you need? I always asked for a prayer for them, for the driver. Like immediately right. that same evening I said, please pray for them because they've got to live with what they've done. Right. Um, and, and then the more that I think about it, it was more of a selfish prayer because I was like, please pray for them because I can't. Right. Yeah. You know, I was being honest. <laughs> <laughs> she was actually better than me because I couldn't pray for her. Yeah. I, I said, I just can't. I just can't. And when the detective that was, uh, you know, doing the case, he had said that there was going to be a delay in the report because apparently Vegas, Las Vegas is, is, has a higher pedestrian accident rate than even New York. Death rate. A death rate. Right. And so we knew that we weren't going to get a report right away. So it was waiting. Mm -hmm. And then when we got the report, there was gaps and there was questions and there was, it it wasn't fully. A lot of inconsistencies. A lot of inconsistencies. And then also we had, you know, a victim advocate that was assigned to us. And so we were getting bits and pieces of information from them about her and there was a lot of struggles. Like my struggle was battle of the mind, and because there was only little glimpses of answers that we were getting, um, the enemy used that mm-hmm. um, to try to anger me and I and her, and mom as well. Mm-hmm. But um, and and it brought me closer to God because I took that anger to Him, and. Um, I always thought that anger was a terrible thing, which we know is not. It's a healthy thing to feel, but but you just don't live there in that anger. And so there was pieces of information that were given to us, like for instance, I'll give one. Um, apparently the next day after the accident, they they traveled. They, they said, oh, they went out of town. Yeah, flew out on vacation. Flew out on vacation, and I was like, who, who does that? Who mm-hmm. does that? You know, and I was angry. I was angry at that. Um, but we'll explain later. But there, there was things that, you know, that there was a lot of questions. And even just um, our decision on if we wanted to pursue legal action against her, mm-hmm. go to trial, what her sentencing would be, um, those things were, you know, in the background of the questions of what, what we wanted yeah, it was all very confusing too. Yeah, it was all very confusing. Um, am I getting ahead of myself? About okay, it came down to the point where um, we finally, after two and a half years, we finally had an actual court date that we were actually going to go to court. And there was three attorneys, and two of the attorneys felt we should negotiate. One felt that we 
he could win the trial. He said, and then they asked him, well, what's the percentage you think you could win the trial? And they, he said 70%. So Heather and I had a decision to make. Do we negotiate or do we go to trial? And I, I think I remember telling you 70% is not good enough for me, you know. And one part of me wanted to just go to trial, the other didn't. But they pointed out to me, you know, we, if we go to trial, we could lose this case and she would get no conviction. She would walk around walk away free how would you feel if she walked away free you have to remember we really didn't know a whole lot about this person at that time we didn't we just knew that there was a, they suspected she had a medical condition but um so um i was really struggling and i don't know about you but yeah. i was struggling with do we do this or do we negotiate and i actually had a couple of friends call me and they asked me they said what would dave what would Dave want you and Heather to do? Would he want you to continue to put yourself through this? And my answer was, no, he wouldn't want us to keep putting ourselves through this. It had already been two and a half years. And every, like every few months, it would be, okay, we're going to court. Now we're not going to court. It's being pushed back, pushed back, and pushed back. So we did actually end up you know, going to negotiation. You want to share? Yeah, um, so th we decided to um, negotiate. And so there was a, she was convicted with vehicular manslaughter. They, they agreed to, to take that charge. And there was terms and conditions that she had to do in order to, you know, um, to not go to jail. And she, and, was, on probation and she was on probation for about a year. And um, one of the things when we were all meeting with the DA, or just over the phone, because this all like this COVID. all happened in 2020, the year that we don't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so one of the things that they said was, well, do you want a letter from them, yeah. a letter of apology? And no. I instantly turned to mom and I said, and I told them too, and I didn't even like consult with her. I just said, no. I said, it's been two and a half years. If she wanted to ha write us a letter, she would have. And I'm not going to make it be court. court mandated, you know, because it, how genuine is that really? Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't out of anger, but it was just out of like, the lawyer probably would have written it, you know, yeah. it, it wouldn't have been from her anyway. <laughs> yeah. And there's probably something, a draft already in the file, you know, <laughs> and, um, and I don't mean to make light of it, but that's how good God is, is that we can laugh about this now. Right. Um, but just the fact that, you know, we, just the anxiety of going to court, having a date, then it being canceled. And then, you know, like even with my, oh, cause I had a new boss at that time and I was having to explain, Hey, I may need this day off. Oh, never mind, I don't need it off. Need it off. it yeah. got canceled. And uh, luckily I was able to share with her why, you know, cause like, can you imagine telling your new boss, Hey, I have to go to court. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Why? yeah, I got legal issues. No, <laughs> but um, but it's just one of those things where um, when the the court date finally did come, um, it was in October of 2020, yeah. and um, we had again we're in a pandemic, guys, and um, we didn't know what we were going to be facing. We went in, and there was about six people that showed up with us to support us for that day. Some people had COVID and weren't able to be there. That's correct, or had a COVID scare. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, that was Heidi, I mean, Heidi, Holly. I, Holly. <laughs> but um, we met down, it was downtown at the courthouse, and I remember we were all waiting outside, and that was another story in itself. I'm going to stop you real okay. quick. Okay, yeah, quick. no, that's fine. No, no, no. I want to back up and talk okay. about your victim statements. statements. Yeah. Oh, yes, okay. that's right. I don't right. want you guys to miss that. Thank you. Yeah. 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 For the struggle with the victim statements. Yeah, I'll let mom go first because she went first telling yeah. her victim well, statement. <laughs> we actually, we did read our victim statements. The victim advocate read a couple statements from Dave's best friends. And um, she was going to let Heather or I read it. And we decided, hey, we want you to read them because we didn't want to get up there and we were already going to cry enough, you know, so we didn't want to cry with two more statements. So I got up first and read my statement, and I, I basically had to um, 
outlined, I basically outlined um, what happened that You had day. written it like a year before. Well, yeah, yeah I had written one happened. like earlier, be- soon after the accident. And like the night or two before the trial date, I pulled it up to read it again. Mm-hmm. And I went, oh, my goodness, I got to rewrite this. Yeah. Because... Although people would ask me, how do you feel about this lady? I would tell them, I don't know. I don't feel anything for her. I don't feel anything. But when I read that victim statement that I wrote originally, I thought, oh, my goodness. i got to rewrite this. I was very angry in this, in this victim statement. Mm-hmm. I mean, I blankly said in there, I want her to go to jail. She killed my husband, and I want her to go to jail. And um, so I rewrote it, and basically how I started it out was that Dave had always taught Heather, when he was teaching her to drive, he always taught her that a car is a weapon. And I said, how ironic that it was a car that took his life. And then I outlined the day, how, you know, what I, my experience was and how I learned about my husband being killed And I expressed some other concerns about, you know, he he was my best friend, my soulmate, and my husband, but, and he was my true north. And and then went into the financial aspect of it. I said, you know, the day she took his life, she took away two-thirds of my income. And as I turned, as I ended it, I was a little more gracious, where I, I mean, that wasn't that bad to me, but... I um, said that I just prayed that we all can move on with our lives now. You know, it, it, it happened, and I, w- I hope that we all can move forward with our lives. That she, I was very impressed with her, though. <laughs> so um, the night, well, when I knew that the court date was actually going to happen, because I was like, I'm not going to believe this is going to happen until, like, it actually happens. And so it, we finally got the confirmation that it wasn't going to get canceled or rescheduled. And I remember, um, because, and that's another story, but there were dreams that I had of dad. And um, I, as much as, as the anger and the questions that I had that I didn't have the answers to, I knew that I didn't want her to go to jail. And I, I, I didn't even want to read a victim statement simply because I felt like me reading it was rubbing salt into the wound of what she probably already had to, you know, like think of every single day. And I remember I shared this with Rosie and Holly, and um, of course they immediately said, let's video chat. And so we we all FaceTime or Google Duoed, whatever, at the time. And uh, they prayed with me, and they told me that that victim statement wasn't for her necessarily, but it was for me and for my healing. And so I, I that the night before, I um, wrote my statement out. I decided that I would do it, and and I would. And so I asked to be last um, to read it. Um, but to kind of backtrack, when we all were waiting outside the courtroom, as I was, as we were driving in, I was praying to the Lord. I said, "Lord, let me love this person through Your eyes," because I, and I'd always had a fear of when I saw them, like how I would react. Mm-hmm. And I always said, "Lord, let me just if I see them." Let me love them through your eyes that only only you can do. And um, we were waiting outside, and I didn't even know that she was over to the left of us this whole time as we're waiting. And then somebody told me, I think, I it, I think it was the victim advocate that told us that she was right there, and I was like, oh, okay. What can you do? <laughs> I'm just like a normal person. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Yeah. And um, so we were waiting outside, and they they said, oh, well, you know, because of COVID, they may not let everybody in. And I I immediately was like, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry, guys. You came down here for me, and you're not going to be able to go in. And um, the victim advocate, or the deputy, they, um, they actually cleared half of the courtroom for us so that all of us could go in and sit and witness this and, and, and be able to be a part of it for support. 
And so um, we were able to do that. And I read, I read my victim statement. And if I'm going too much, let me know. Um, but <laughs> in my victim statement, I had mentioned that, you know, he was my best friend, that my dad was the calm to my storm. If I was ever upset, like he was the first person that I would go to and talk to, and he would be able to calm me down. And as I was like reading this and typing it up, I heard the Lord clearly state, I am the calm to your storm. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to still read it, Lord, <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the judge. I'm still going to read it. Um, so I did, and, and I shared I had a dream of dad, and this is just how he was, but we were in the car, and I had a dream, and, I, and um, I, we were in the car for some reason, in a drive through of all things. And... <laughs> He didn't it, like drive throughs Yeah, he did it. And, but and then he was like kind of awake. Like he was, he was like, I don't know if he had been sleeping or something, but he kind of shook awake. And he, the first words out of his mouth in the dream were, oh my goodness, is she okay? And I was like, no, dad. I was like, you're the one that died. She's living. And, and in the statement, I said, you know, that just showed his character that he was more concerned about her than he was of himself. And if he could be concerned, even though he's, parting it up with Jesus, you know, um, but like if he could be concerned, then I could be concerned as well. And I care about her. Mm -hmm. And so I read that to her and I shared it and I turned to her and I looked at her and I said her name and I said, I forgive you. Mm -hmm. And I truly meant it. And I know that yeah. that was the Lord because yeah. there's no way that I could have done it in my own human flesh. Um, and she just looked to me and she said, thank you. And we both started crying. And I said, you know, um, we will continue to pray for you. We've been praying for me, for you since day one. And, um, and it was just, it was a big moment. And like, as soon as that was said, there was like this weight that I'd been carrying for two and a half years was lifted off of me yeah. and it was freeing you guys. It was freeing. Well, um, Heather actually had been praying for a medical reason the whole time. I, the whole time she says, I just pray for a medical reason. And as it turns out, apparently she had been treated for migraines, and a doctor had said she had dry blood on her brain, but there was no problem for her to drive or anything. So then the accident happened. And then she flew out to to go on vacation, which it wasn't really, we learned later, I don't think it was an actual vacation, it was to visit either a, a sickly friend or an el elderly parent, because she had her elderly mom lived in Vegas, and she um, had, been, had come from having lunch with her mom at the nursing home. So, um, Heather prayed for that medical reason, and yeah, doesn't that isn't that horrible? Like I was also selfish too, because I prayed for a medical reason. Because if she was texting or yeah. just reaching for something, it was harder to forgive. Well, yeah, it, <laughs> it is yeah. because you're like, well, she, was she on the phone? Was she texting? Did she reach down to pick up something, that, which caused her to drift that way? Um, but um, she, it, it then after she got back from her vacation, she went to another surgeon. And he put her in the hospital, and he operated on her. She had like a brain leak. leak? I think it's brain I forgot bleed. The, brain bleed. Brain bleed. Yeah. And they think she had. I always get it wrong. So, she had been misdiagnosed, and so um, she was having vacant seizures. Mm -hmm. And they we, and they believe that that's what happened that, at yeah, the they time. They believe that's what happened at the time, and so because. I don't mean to interrupt, but because at the time of the report that we read, she had made the statement, I just blinked and he was there. Yeah. And we're like, what? Yeah. You know, the questions. I'd no, it's okay. Yeah. And, and um, like I said, Heather had been praying for a medical condition. For me, I just, I just really, I, I really couldn't pray for a long time. And um, I remember telling God, my soul is so hurt. She's hurt my soul more than anybody possibly ever could. Mm -hmm. And I said, God, I had to reach out to him and say, please heal my soul. And at that point, I was able to start thinking her a little bit more. God revealed to me. He said, you know, Teresa, this could have happened to you. It could have happened to Heather. And he said, how would you feel 
if it happened to one of you and somebody wanted you to go to jail. Yeah. I mean, she had a perfect record. There was no criminal record or anything. But it was, I really, I really had to ask for, to God to heal that soul because I was hurt so badly. I just never have been hurt that bad in my life. But you have to realize, I was 19 when Dave and I got married. I was married to him for almost 43 years. I was with him longer than I was with my mom. Mm -hmm. And he was our world, wasn't he? I mean, I know we're supposed to put God first and all that, but um, he was a huge part of our life. And when he was taken away, it was a big hole in our yeah. life. But we're here to su we survived it. And God um, is good. Yeah. Yep. So let me ask you then. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Phil. All God the time. All the time. Yep. Um, let me ask you to finish this statement and encourage, encourage our family here. Um, finish the statement of when God doesn't. Um, when God doesn't? Yeah. Um, for me, even if he didn't spare Dave that day, I know that there was a reason. I mean, Heather and I have talked that if he had survived, it's very possible he probably would have been crippled, and he would have been absolutely miserable because he was very active. And this man walked at least three or four miles a day, and he was in Fitbit challenges with some of my friends, and they couldn't outstep couldn't him. Couldn't they couldn't keep, keep up, up with him. him. <laughs> and so we, we knew that if he had survived, he would be miserable. And, mm -hmm. But the thing is, even if God didn't spare him, God has shown us that even though we don't have biological family in Las Vegas, that we have family. And there's people here who love and care about us, and they have become our family. And so even if he didn't spare him, I'm, I still have faith in him, I trust him, and I try to listen a lot more than I used to. Um, but I will always trust in him, have faith in him, and have hope in him. My hope was never taken away. I, I, I won't let Satan steal my joy. And because um, God does, even though you're suffering and going through a grieving process, and everybody goes through grieving differently. Some, some may get over it in a year. Some may take two years, three years, five years. But even though you're grieving, God's going to bring some kind of joy into your life. And you just got to stop and, and realize it, you know. And he is good. All the time. All the time. <laughs> and, you know, the thing is, um, I didn't share this. Maybe I'm getting too long-winded, too. I really feel <clears throat> Dave had, um, and I'm so grateful for this, Dave had a dream. Uh, he, he woke up on Sunday morning, which was Easter. That right? was the, it, um, Easter, it was Easter Sunday right before the accident yeah right before the accident and um he he shared with heather and i both and he said i he was he was asleep but he, and he said in his dream he he woke up and he went to let our dog lucy out and he said when he opened that door there was a man standing there with dark hair and he was smiling at him he said i immediately shut the door and turned to walk into the bedroom he said, when I walked into that bedroom, towards the bedroom, this man was standing in the doorway, and he was smiling at me. He said, I wasn't afraid. I hope I get it right. But he said, I felt alone. Right? Is that right? Cause no, he said, I wasn't afraid, but I instantly knew that I, I, I was dead. But, and he didn't get to say goodbye. And that he didn't get to say goodbye yeah. to mom and I. So, and some the other things that had happened that weekend was he was watching, am I doing something wrong? Okay. Um, he, he started watching these Christian movies, and he, he, he did go to Bibles. He went to um, Life Group, and he also, you know, went to church and stuff. But Dave had a lot of questions about stuff. And um, he often said to me, I envy you. And I said, why do you envy me? He said, because you believe without knowing. And I'm like, well... I just, that's all I've ever had is my faith, you know. And he started watching these Christian movies. The last movie we went together to see was Mercy Me. And then uh, he was watching um, Heaven's For Real. Heaven is For Real. 
And he, but he, and I think he saw God's not dead that weekend. And he, he didn't, when he told me about the dream and I said, well, did you finish seeing God's not, God's, I mean, God's for real. And he said, no, I didn't see the ending. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. And um, he, he said, no, but the man that he described to me sounded just like the picture that they showed in the movie. In the movie. So I of Jesus. Re- yeah, of Jesus. I really, truly believe that Jesus came to Dave. And I kind of played it off as, I've kind of played it off as, maybe Jesus is just letting you know everything's going to be okay. He wants you to know he's for real. And then that was on the Sunday, and then on the following Wednesday, the accident happened. But I am grateful for that dream because he shared it with Heather and I. And I, like I said, I will always believe it was Jesus. No one will ever tell me any different. So mine's not going to be as wordy as sorry. mom's. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, guys. But um, uh, apolo- like even what was the statement again? Um, when God doesn't. When God it. doesn't. Or even if. Or yeah, even if like what they say on their e- even if He is still good. Um, but mine is I will I will still praise you. I will still praise Him through everything. Through um, worship was one of those things that was I was able to do and. It helped me because even when I didn't feel like worshiping, putting that music on and declaring his truths and and his words and like when I wasn't feeling it, I still was able to sing it. And there was a peace that would happen when that happened. When when that happened, when that. (laughs) So yes, it it would be, I, you know, I, I will still praise you. Yeah. Even if. And today you get to do that. Yes. You get to worship. And we're going to go into a time of worship. But can we please give him a hand? This Thank is- you, guys. It's hard to get up here and share your story. And so I thank you both. Thank you, ladies, both for doing that. And then um, 